Hello. Here's my homily for the 27th Sunday in Ordinary Time, which is Sunday the 6th of October. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The story of how the first man met the first woman, as in Genesis, which is our, which Jesus refers to in our gospel today, is one of those passages that has upset and angered some women who mistakenly see it as an assertion that man is more important than woman in the eyes of God. Some women even sarcastically refer to themselves as the spare rib in order to show how ludicrous and wicked this idea is. But notice I said that people like this are mistaken, and I'll now try to explain why. So let's start with Jesus and see how he views this ancient story. The point is that Jesus is tackling the way divorce took place in his time. And this was most definitely a very male dominated affair. If a man didn't like his wife for any reason, it seems he simply dismissed her with a written note. And that was that she was sent back to her family as nothing more than damaged goods. Now, this, you must agree, is a terrible, indeed, a wicked view of divorce. Divorce is really an easy thing, but at least nowadays, the law here in Britain tries to make the situation between the two people as fair as possible. Of course, it can never be entirely fair, not least because the person with the most money to pay lawyers clearly has, as in many other matters, an advantage. And also simply because married couples whatever the law intends, can be, and often are, very cruel to one another. But to get back to the teaching of Jesus, we see that he uses this story not to support male dominance, but to challenge this ancient view of divorce and to challenge the idea of a wife as an object to be accepted or discarded as best suits the man. Instead, it is meant to show that men and women are created equal by God. But, says the feminist, all this talk of woman created from the rib of a man is a degrading image. How does it show that men and women are equal? Of course, the first thing to remember is that this story is not meant to be taken as literally true. As I hope most of you know already, there are two stories of the creation at the beginning of the Bible, and neither can be literally true, since they actually contradict one another. In the first, God creates the world in six days, and we humans, men and women, are created on the last, on the sixth day. In the second, the story we're looking at, man is created first, before everything else, then all the other things are created, and then God creates woman. Each story is told to convey truths about us and the world, and neither is meant to tell us what actually happened. Look at it this way. If someone was told the story of a race between the tortoise and the hare, a story that teaches that being slow and steady in life is often a better policy than being hasty and proud, it would be crazy if they then asked, did a hare and a tortoise actually have a race like this? In the same way, the story we're looking at from Genesis does not claim that God actually took a rib from man to make woman. No, the rib is a metaphor used to explain equality, not something to be taken literally. The story then shows man seeking a helpmate, which could equally be translated in modern terms as a partner. The story wants to assert the important truth that woman and only woman is a true partner for man, and thus man, and only man, is a true partner for woman. The animals are all named, but none can be truly called a partner. So sorry, all you dog lovers. Dogs can indeed be great friends, but not partners, however much you love them. The story of woman created from the rib of man, far from being a declaration that woman is inferior to man, is actually quite the opposite. 
It is a story that's meant to convey that woman is equal to man. That's why Jesus uses it when challenging unequal divorce. And that's why in the original story, man cries out, this at last is bone from my bones and flesh from my flesh. In other words, here at last is something equal to me. Now, at this point, someone might say, what about St. Paul and his talk about a wife obeying her husband? Well, yes, St. Paul did say this, but he also followed it immediately by saying that a man must love his wife as Jesus loved the church. And we hear what that meant in our second reading, that Jesus experienced death for us. Hardly an easy ride for husbands then. And later St. Paul says not only that the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. But immediately follows this with, likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. An awful lot of dominant men now and through the ages have conveniently failed to notice this. But there it is, backing up Jesus's teaching on male-female equality. You can imagine that the men of Jesus's day found these ideas very challenging indeed, as it told them to look back beyond the law of Moses to the original will of God. And it's a pity that Christian men down throughout history, and often today as well, have not allowed this story to teach them how to treat women. That's why we need to hear it regularly as we do this Sunday. The story, as I hope you can now see, is not just about the high calling of marriage, in which men and women should aim for a lifelong commitment to one another and where divorce should be avoided, if at all possible. But it is also an assertion by Jesus, using this ancient story, that men and women are equal and must treat one another so. Indeed, that this partnership is a great gift from God. In marriage, a man leaves his father and mother and joins himself to his wife, and they become one body. And the church teaches that this giving of themselves to one another is a sacrament. That As they take hold of each other's hands in the marriage ceremony, that is a sacrament, a sign of the presence of God. God made present for his world. So may God Almighty bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>